You've hunted hard all day. You put tons of miles on your boots, and now you're sitting at camp eating a freeze-dried dinner and wanting nothing more than to climb into your sleeping bag and sack out for the night. But if you didn't choose your sleeping pad carefully, you're going to get that awful awake every 20 minutes kind of sleep, and that's going to get old real fast. Let's fix that. What's up guys, it's Eric from Late to the Game Outdoors, and today we're talking about sleeping pads. When I first started backcountry hunting, I had absolutely zero idea how important these were. I mean, I had one, I'm not an animal, but it was a total afterthought. I spent a couple seasons on the super cheap rolled up foam thing that you get at Walmart for like 15 bucks. It looks like a giant green ho-ho tied to the outside of your pack. Zero insulation, virtually no actual padding. It took three nights during a cold snap on a January deer hunt before I finally decided that simply wasn't cutting it. So I decided it was time for an upgrade, but I had heard all these horror stories about guys popping holes in an inflatable pad and it kind of freaked me out. It made sense that the inflatable would be immensely more comfortable, but it felt like gambling. Like I'd either have the best night's sleep or it would pop and I'd have the absolute worst night's sleep. The worst. Wanting to play it safe, I went with the classic Thermarest egg carton thing. Uh, this one was lined with the reflective coating that's supposed to reflect your body heat back into you, keeping you warmer. I also had vague memories of sleeping on an egg carton style pad like that in Boy Scouts and figured it would be more comfortable at least than the simple flat pad I had been on. Then I took it to Colorado for six nights. I'm talking about a little place called Aspen. Actually, it wasn't Aspen, but that's beside the point. I'm a side sleeper, and on shorter trips that were just like a night or two long, I didn't have any major issues. But after three or four nights sleeping on that thing, my shoulders and my hips were starting to kill me. Like I'd sleep for about an hour, wake up with those two highest impact spots aching, flip over to my other side, catch another hour of sleep, wake up with the same problem, flip back over. It was like that all night. The foam just wasn't cutting it. And as if I was still gonna talk myself out of switching from the foam, a massive cold front moved in and nighttime temps dipped below freezing. For the love, it was so cold. That little silver coating might as well have not been there. I could feel all the cold coming up through the ground. And since the down in the bottom of the sleeping bag gets compressed under your body weight, it turns out you're really relying on your pad for warmth on the bottom. So I survived that trip and immediately started shopping for a backcountry inflatable sleeping pad. Fortunately, companies have finally adopted a consistent rating system for just how warm their pads are. So look for the R value number when you're checking out options. The higher the number, the warmer the pad. Unless you're planning to buy a pad for summer only kinds of trips, and who's doing that, I'd recommend making an R value in at least the mid threes your minimum requirement. And honestly, there's almost no reason not to push it above four if you plan to take it on some potentially sub-freezing late season hunts. The first night I spent on my inflatable pad was magic. It had an R value of 4.8, and I could literally feel the heat radiating back into my body all night long. That night got down into the high 30s, and it almost felt too warm sometimes. But I knew that first night that I would never go back to the foam pad. The risk of an inflatable pad failing was well worth the warmth and comfort, in my humble opinion. That being said, I did have that first pad fail eventually. Second year in Colorado, on the last night of the trip, I woke up a couple times and in that like half-dazed stupor you feel in the middle of the night, I kept thinking, man, why does my butt and hip hurt? Well, it turns out the pad had popped in the middle of the night and was losing air slowly enough to just gradually let those high pressure areas hit the ground. If it was the middle of the trip, I did have my old foam pad back at the truck and I could have made that big round trip to swap it out, but since it was conveniently the end of the trip anyway, I just packed out of there to deal with customer service later. Which actually leads me to a quick endorsement of Nemo and their incredible customer service. 
I explained to them that I had spent a total of about 10 nights on that pad, that I had thoroughly cleared the ground, I was running a footprint under my tent, there was no reason it should have popped. I sent it in, and they confirmed it had failed when it shouldn't have, and they were going to make it right. Unfortunately, it was smack dab in the middle of COVID, they were out of stock on most of their pads, but they gave me full retail credit for the pad, and all I had to do was wait a little bit for their warehouse to reload. It actually ended up working out for the best. To shave a few ounces and dollars, I had decided to buy the regular size pad. Listen, I'm 6'1", I weigh about 210 pounds, I'm not a giant, but I'm not a small dude, and I figured I was just small enough to make the regular pad work. But man, was it a pain. If I laid on my back, my torso was exactly as wide as the pad, so my arms hung off each side and were annoyingly cold. When I turned on my side, I couldn't bend my legs too much or they would start to slide off the pad also. So when some pads finally became available on the site, I opted for a different model than I had at first, the Tensor Alpine Ultralight, and I went with the tall wide size. It's the same 4.8R value and only added six ounces to my whole setup. It is heaven. I finally feel like I'm not fighting to not fall off the pad all night, and it's so warm. Uh, that's really warm. Plus, just a little bonus that has me fully in love with Nemo. At the time, the cost of my first pad they had refunded me was almost $100 more than this pad, so I also picked up the Nemo spike tent I had been wanting to try just by adding a few bucks to the deal. They're a great company to work with. Okay, to wrap this up, if you're currently into or even thinking about trying backcountry hunting or even just backpacking, an inflatable pad is absolutely the way to go. My new pad and most of the other pads out there, they come with a patch kit built right into the stuff sack, so if you do run into a leak, you can fix it and get back in the game without it ruining your whole trip. It's a little more weight, but the warmth doesn't even compare to the lighter foam options. Those foam pads with the reflective coating can only seem to get up to about a 2 on the R value scale. And so other than mild nights in the middle of the summer, I just don't think that cuts it. If you want to check out this pad in particular, I'll put a link down below. And if you're even on the cusp of the tall wide spectrum, do yourself a favor and just buy the bigger one. I guarantee you won't regret it. If you haven't already, please do me a favor and subscribe right down here. And if you want to see how this pad ties in with the rest of my backcountry kit, check out this video over here to see the full gear dump. And if you want to see one of the Colorado hunts I just talked about, go ahead and check that out right over there. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you guys next time.